Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 FM and UPTV. My name is Mr. Garza and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU or UCIMC, or as we like to say on this show, UPTV, because we're on UPTV as well. Uh, these views are our own. And by our in this instance, I mean myself and anyone whose stories I may happen to be reading to you today, tonight, whenever you hear this. Um, yeah, missed a week or so in there somewhere. I, I'm still getting into the rhythm of how to do this show successfully, uh, consistently from home and edit and all that stuff uh, used to be pretty easy. I'd just show up at the studio, sit down, turn everything on be, uh, at the right time and start going for it. And then I'd be done and it would, I just have to do a little editing later, but now I have to find time in my day and I can't do it on Monday. Anyway, it's a long story, but it's complicated getting this thing done now that I'm doing it this way. And um, so, We'll see. Uh, it's still intermittent. Anyway, <clears throat> I thought I would begin with a story entitled Immigrants Nearly Twice as Likely to Start Businesses. Um, we still hear a lot, a lot about, a lot of negative things about immigrants that are just sort of across the board negative. But to a certain extent, interestingly, the conversation has changed a bit not only because we no longer have the disinformer in chief uh, as the president uh, using that giant soapbox that the president has to just spread all sorts of garbage around, um, <clears throat> but also because a lot of the pro and con arguments about immigration have, have been repeated so many times that nobody feels the need to say them anymore. <laughs> So it's kind of like the assumptions are just there. So on, on one hand, we have the assumption that immigrants are hardworking and an asset to this country, a benefit, uh, et cetera, et cetera, people like myself. And then on the other side, you have, oh, they're stealing jobs and using up our resources and, and uh, laying around using public benefits and uh, spreading disease, you know, all these different kinds of things. But Everybody has said those over and over, and, and neither side has really, I won't say we haven't listened to each other. I mean, I have listened and listened and listened to the anti-immigrant side in order to see if there's any starting point of dismantling that argument. And no, there really isn't because they don't, you know, you can say, here's what's actually happening. And they go, no. <laughs> And that's the end of the conversation. So it's like, okay, but here's the statistic. No. Here's, uh, you know, proof. No. So that's pretty much what the conversations have been like. Um, so anyway, I won't say that nobody's listening, but it, there's no need to repeat the same arguments anymore because uh, we're not hearing those. We've heard them before. And I've heard all the anti-immigrant ar arguments that you can think of and a few that you probably would be surprised that anybody made. And, um, you know, they haven't changed a bit, no matter what information uh, is brought to light. It doesn't change anything because they've just decided that immigrants are bad. But anyway, uh, this, this story is interesting because it shows that Yes, not only are immigrants here working, but they are starting businesses. So anyway, <clears throat> I will read it and you can judge for yourself. Uh, immigrants in the United States are more likely to create jobs than to take them, according to a new study examining the role of immigrants in entrepreneurship. Researchers found that immigrants not only expand labor supply as workers, but also expand labor demand as founders of firms and do so at much higher rates than their native-born counterparts. Existing research has shown that immigrants start businesses at higher rates than native-born individuals do, but this paper expands on that research and finds that immigrants are not simply starting small businesses, 
but that they are more likely to start more firms of every size. The study, forthcoming in American Economic Review, used administrative records from the Internal Revenue Service of every firm founded in the U.S. between 2005 and 2010, as well as the U.S. Census Bureau's Survey of Business Owners. So this is like legitimate data, folks. It's not just uh, Joe did a survey of 14 people and found that blah, blah, blah. No, this is, you know, the IRS and, and the census. Anyway, Pierre Azoulay, a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, said he and his co-authors had a data window into entrepreneurship that hadn't previously been available to researchers. That gave us a data... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. This is one of those articles that <laughs> where... They're just like, every other line seems to repeat the one before it. But anyway, I, I, that's a quibble I have with the way some things are written. Uh, so this guy, he said his co-authors had a data window in um, entrepreneurship and followed by a quote that says, quote, that gave us a data window into entrepreneurship at scale and over time in a way that simply had not been possible before or any other research team, he said. So data into, uh, a data window into entrepreneurship is, was obtained by these people. Anyway, between 2005 and 2010, 0.83% of immigrants in the workforce started a business, compared to 0.46% of native-born individuals. Immigrants exhibit an 80% higher entrance rate into entrepreneurship, according to the research. As business owners, immigrants are more, also more likely to employ other people, Azuli said. The total employment assigned to immigrant-founded firms per immigrant in the workforce is 49% larger than the total employment of native-founded firms per native worker in the workforce. 49% larger. That's amazing. This is true even for Fortune 500 companies. For each firm in the 2017 Fortune 500 ranking, the researchers looked at the founding year, founder names, and founder's country of birth. Unlike small and medium-sized businesses with fewer employees, these larger companies are more likely to have multiple founders, so the researchers used multiple definitions of immigrant firm to include anyone on the founding team being an immigrant and the highest paid founder being an immigrant, as well as a more proportional approach where they looked at the fraction of founders who are immigrants versus not in a particular firm size. No matter the framework they looked at, though, the basic qualitative story stayed the same. Immigrant entrepreneurs are overrepresented among the ranks of high-growth entrepreneurs relative to natives, he said. So it's not just a small-scale phenomenon. It exists at every firm rank at every size. Past research with labor supply-oriented analyses often paints immigrants as competing with local workers in depressing wages, while natural experiments often show more positive results of immigrants, according to the research. The findings in this paper may help to resolve the tension between these two viewpoints. <laughs> oh, good luck with that, according to researchers. Optimism exists everywhere. Azuli said that while his findings show a correlation between immigrants and higher rates of entrepreneurship, he and his colleagues are interested in doing further research into what might be causing these differences. What we want to know next is what kind of immigration policies, in particular, have the potential of affecting entry into entrepreneurship by immigrants, he said, noting that entry into high-growth companies is of particular interest. Is it the case that more immigrants actually do cause more high-growth companies? Establishing that, I think, would be important. <clears throat> so I, I selected this article because it, it kind of takes on something that I was talking about last show, which is two weeks ago or something like that. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> about how immigrants are in many ways like younger people in the sense that they're, they are at a time in their life, in a situation in their life, where they're starting over. So just as, you know, kids coming out of high school or college or whatever are starting out in life, and so they're like, what am I going to do? 
here I am uh, standing at the beginning of this road into the future. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to achieve? You know, it's a time in life when you're beginning, when you're looking for possibilities, or you're looking at possibilities, and you're looking for a path to get there. Um, and so immigrants, regardless of their age, are at a similar point in life where they've said, all right, I'm leaving this, my past behind. I've packed everything up. I've moved to this new country. Um, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? You know, here are all an array of possibilities. What path will I take to get me to the one that seems the brightest to me? And so <clears throat> in that sense, it's like, regardless of the age, it's like adding a bunch of, a whole bunch of young people to the country. And that, those are the people that make things happen. Uh, you know, people that are ready and willing and able to do new things. It's not people who are like, oh, I'm tired and, uh, you know, I'm pretty comfortable the way I am and where I am. So I'm just going to kind of coast here for, uh, just coast on out for life, you know, go to a movie every now and then. <laughs> but that's the extent of my excitement. You know, there are a lot of people in that, and there's nothing wrong with that kind of existence. You know, if it, if it makes you happy, it's fine to be satisfied. In fact, I think it's a great thing to be satisfied with what you have. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the people who are satisfied with what they have are not the people that are generally trying new things and creating uh, new businesses and, and uh, taking big risks. They're the people who are just like, it's pretty good the way it is. I'm just going to keep it this way. So <clears throat> I think, you know, this makes a lot of sense logically if you think about it like that. And it's really good to know. I, unlike the authors, I don't suspect it's going to really change the conversation because uh, the people that are anti-immigrant are, by and large, anti-immigrant. They don't care what good comes of immigrants coming here. They care what they see as the problems associated with it. And the problems that they list are usually the ones that are more palatable to share. So you can say, oh, they're taking our jobs, or they're using our resources, or they're, you know, whatever. They, they share those things because those are concerns that, if true, we would all agree were bad things. What deep down inside they're thinking, though, in my opinion, and uh, from my observation, is that, oh, these people are changing the landscape in ways that I don't like. They're changing our society. They're changing our culture. <clears throat> they're introducing new ways of looking at things. and and thinking about things, and that scares me. That it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that. <clears throat> I like things the way they used to be. So that, I think, is the real reason, and therefore no amount of, hey, but this, or hey, but that, is going to change any of those opinions. But still, there probably are a lot of people, you know, sort of straddling the fence somewhere who don't really know what they think about it, that might be influenced by something like this. So I feel it is important to push this forward. Okay, moving on. Um, <clears throat> last show, I talked about this, the Supreme Court taking up this case, uh, what I, which I described in great detail towards the end there. And now here is the result of that. Uh, so this is a nice <laughs> bookend of this. Last show, I talked about the beginnings of it and the problem. And this show, I'll tell you how it turned out. So <clears throat> this is entitled, Supreme Court Sides with Undocumented Immigrant Fighting Deportation. Surprised, aren't you? I was too. The Supreme Court on Thursday sided with an undocumented Guatemalan immigrant seeking to challenge his removal from the U.S. by immigration authorities. In a 6-3 to three decision authored by Justice Neil Gorsuch, who I have to admit has surprised me on more than one occasion, uh, the court said the Justice Department was violating federal law by not providing immigrants it seeks to deport with a single comprehensive notice to appear 
with details on the charges and scheduled court appearance. Quote, if men must turn square corners when they deal with the government, it cannot be too much to expect the government to turn square corners when it deals with them, Gorsuch wrote in an opinion joined by a remarkable alignment of justices. Clarence Thomas, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Amy Coney Barrett. <laughs> so this is... You've heard the term odd bedfellows. This is a, this is a pretty odd collection of uh, Supreme Court bedfellows here. So the square corners doctrine of fairness and due process Gorsuch cited was penned by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said in a 1920 decision that a private company could not challenge its tax bill. In subsequent years, lower courts invoked similar language to describe government obligations to citizens. Justice Brett Kavanaugh penned a dissent that was joined by Chief, Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Samuel Alito. Augusto Niz Chavez, who brought the case, illegally crossed the southern U.S. border in 2005 and eventually settled in Detroit, Michigan. In 2013, the government initiated removal proceedings against him, first sending a notice of the charges and later sending a second notice with the date and time of his court appearance. The timing of the multiple notices was at the heart of the case. Under federal law, an immigrant can only appeal a removal order if they've been in the U.S. continuously for at least 10 years, and the same law says that the clock stops once a notice to appear is issued. Did you get that? So they can only appeal if they've been continuously for 10 years, and the clock stops once a notice to appear is issued. Ni Chavez argued the multiple notices he received did not constitute a single notice to appear as required by law. Sounds complicated. At one level, today's dispute may seem semantic, focused on a single word, a small one at that. But words are how the law constrains power. In this case, the law's terms ensure that when the federal government seeks a procedural advantage against an individual, it will at least supply him with a single and reasonably, reasonably comprehensive statement of the nature of the proceedings against him, Gorsuch wrote. Justice Kavanaugh, in a rare break with his fellow Trump nominee, said he strongly disagreed. The court today agrees with Nies Chavez that, in order to stop the 10-year clock, the government must provide written notice in one document, not two. I find the court's conclusion rather perplexing as a matter of statutory interpretation and common sense. I therefore respectfully dissent, he wrote. The case is a blow to the government's efforts to expedite removal of some undocumented immigrants amid a surge of illegal entries to the U.S. that have clogged court systems and strained enforcement capabilities. Okay, now that I've read the story, I'm not sure this is referring to the same story that I read last time or not. I thought it was the, I thought this was the only uh, item before the court right now. And if so, either they're describing it very differently here, uh, maybe just the point that the, the decision revolved around is different from the one that was explained in the last. So in the last one uh, that I was reading about, it had to do with the temporary uh, what is it called? Tenth? Temporary? Yeah, I, I can't remember that. I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll look this up and I'll figure it out. Anyway, it was a complicated thing and it, it lasted a long time. And I'm really not sure this is the same one. In, in any case, it's, it seems good because it clarifies something that I'm sure a lot of people have had trouble figuring out. And clearly the courts have trouble dealing with it. But, um, I'll follow up on this before. It was a temporary TPS, temporary protected status, was what seemed to me to be the key in the last story that I read that I thought was the big case coming before the court, where this person entered without documentation, without inspection, I believe is the term, entered without inspection. And then in the meantime, citizens from that country were covered by temporary 
protective status, or the TPS, and therefore the question, as I understood it, was, did that change in status change the status of the person, of the individual? So even though he was sent notices to, you know, show up in court, uh, his response was, well, no, the, the temporary protected status, I don't have to do that. And so that went back and forth all the way up to the Supreme Court. And uh, maybe that is still yet to be decided. I don't know. But this, this is interesting anyway. This is an interesting one because they don't really explain, at least not very well to me, to a non-judicially inclined person, as someone who has, has no legal uh, education, I don't really quite understand what the argument is here. So he sent multiple notices to appear. <clears throat> but he was only supposed to be sent one. I don't know. I'm going to do some more research on both of these and, and get back to you on this because I am not following this at all. I have time. I'm going to try to rush through this story here. Uh, this is uh, findings from the Cato Institute 2021 Immigration and Identity National Survey. So it says the Cato Institute 2021 Immigration and Identity National Survey of 2,600 U.S. adults seeks to explore and examine why Americans support or oppose a more open immigration regime. Americans have complex views on the subject, views they often are unsure how to express. Hence my comment earlier. Most Americans have very positive views of immigration and few have outright wholly negative views. However, many Americans remain conflicted, perceiving immigration to present both immense benefits but also challenges. Academic scholarship and in-depth interviews with experts and laypersons who support more or less immigration informed the questionnaire design for this survey. The survey seeks to quantify these different beliefs and then moves deeper to understand what drives support or opposition to immigration. Given the many benefits of immigration, careful attention is paid to understanding opposition to increasing immigration and the desire to decrease it. For simplicity, this report often refers to those who want to decrease immigration as immigration restrictionists, those who want to increase immigration as immigration expanders, and those who want to maintain current levels as immigration maintainers. Seems logical. <clears throat> In addition, the survey pays careful attention to the beliefs, attitudes, and experiences among foreign-born first-generation immigrants. Immigrants, American-born children identified in this report as second-generation immigrants, and other native-born Americans for whom all grandparents were born in the United States. The survey included additional oversamples of Latino and Asian American respondents who are more likely to be or have family involved in immigration. The survey results show that attitudes across immigration backgrounds often vary and provide unique and helpful insights into how Americans of all immigration backgrounds view the United States and the world. The survey was conducted in English, and thus the responses among first-generation immigrants are limited to those with English fluency. Well, this means that responses among the first generation will reflect the beliefs among this subset of first-generation English-fluent immigrants. For this reason, careful attention is also paid to second-generation immigrants to gain perspective on how first-generation immigrants' views may be similar to or different from other Americans. Furthermore, caution should be used when interpreting results of first-generation immigrants as they are not representative of first-generation immigrants who are not fluent in English. Now, I think that's an important point, and I'm glad they uh, you know, identified it clearly. Section 1. What Americans Think About Immigration Support for more immigration is on the rise. Over the past several decades, support for increased immigration has been on the rise. 
In 1975, only 7% of Americans wanted to increase immigration. 37% wanted to maintain present levels in a plurality. 42% wanted to decrease it, according to Gallup. This was notable because only about 5% of the U.S. population was foreign-born at the time. Hmm. Opposition to immigration reached an apex in the mid-1990s, with 65% wanting less and 7% wanting more. The foreign-born population was about 9% at that time. Soon after, however, support for immigration began to rise precipitously. Today, with about 14% of the population being foreign-born, about as many Americans want to increase immigration, 29%, as decrease it, 33%, according to the Cato Institute 2021 Immigration Survey, consistent with Gallup's polling. 38% want to keep it the same. Hmm. Changes in Democrats' views largely account for this shift. Today, nearly half, 47% of Democrats, support increasing immigration to the U.S., compared to 21% of independents and 11% of Republicans. In contrast, in 2001, Gallup found only 17% of Democrats, 16% of independents, and only 7% of Republicans wanted to increase immigration. Thus, about 20 years ago, partisans had more similar attitudes. Views diverged starting around 2010 when Democratic support began to accelerate. Among all Americans, 57% believe that people's desire to reduce immigration to the United States is motivated by a sincere interest in controlling our borders. 43% say racist beliefs are the true motivation. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I know what percentage I would lean into. Anyway. Democrats stand out, however, with 70% saying that racist beliefs motivate demand for less immigration. In contrast, 60% of independents and 88% of Republicans believe intentions are sincere. Hmm. There's a racial divide as well. White Americans, 61%, are more likely to believe motives are sincere, while a majority, 56%, of African Americans think it's driven by racism. Latino and Asian Americans are divided in half about where motives are racist or sincere. Okay, well, this is, there's a big complicated section here. All right, let's read it. So, who wants to increase, decrease, or keep immigration the same? A profile of immigration expanders, maintainers, and restrictionists. Restrictionists. Restrictionists are more likely than immigration expanders to be white American, 77% versus 61%, and somewhat less likely to be African American, 9% versus 12%. Latino, 8% versus 17%, or Asian American, 3% versus 7%. Sorry. They tend to be older, with 55% versus 35% over the age of 55, and are less likely to have college degrees. 22 versus 36 percent. They have moderate incomes and are about half as likely as expanders to earn more than $100,000 annually. 12 percent versus 20 percent. They are more likely than expanders to live in less populated areas, which is weird. 42 percent versus 21 percent live in a small town or rural area. 